Hi, guys. Um, welcome back after lunch um, into the cool air-conditioned space. I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce Paul Duguid. Paul is a professor at the School of Information and an expert on information quality. He will introduce the panelists. Thanks, Anna. Starting off so well, we'll, we'll try to stay on time. Uh, I can say, I think, uh, first, uh, thank you all of you for coming and staying so far through the day. Um, I can say with some assurance and without disrespect to my fellow uh, conveners of panels that this is the quality panel of the day. <laughs> um, and uh, you will find, um, I hope, some issues of worth, even though I think for some people, uh, quality is perhaps a, an odd um, panel to have in this discussion. Um, uh, let me first, I think what I'd like to do is outline who the panelists are very quickly, then say just a couple of words trying to put some context and some questions to the panel, uh, and then let them get down to it. Um, first uh, to speak will be Mark, Mark Lieberman, who is trustee professor of phonetics at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's director of the Linguistic Data Consortium. Uh, he works a great deal with, as he'll probably tell you, with large, uh, complex uh, corpora of data. Um, some of you may know him, and I'm delighted to meet him in person from the linguist list, which is a wonderful list to follow, and Mark is a great presence on that. Next, also familiar, I think, to many of you, is my colleague from the iSchool, Jeffrey Nunberg. And in fact, one of the reasons this is the quality panel is because there are so many people from the iSchool on it. <laughs> particularly important. Uh, Jeffrey uh, Nunberg is professor uh, in the uh, iSchool. Um, he was formerly at the uh, Xerox Park, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. Some of you, when he begins to speak, may reach down to turn off your radios, as his voice is familiar from fresh air. Uh, if you would turn off your telephones at the same time, that would be a good thing to do. Um, I think one thing about his fresh air pieces, which comes out much more in his books, is again the value of these kinds of corporal for understanding, not just language usage in general, but in just case in particular political language and the implications of our political language. And I think the work he's done on that is very important and also shows the enormous importance of these kinds of database and corpora that we're talking about today. Um, Jeff, like some on this panel too, go back to the days of dialogue and after dialogue to LexisNexis. So <laughs> Google is at the end, Google Books is at the end of a long stream of work in these areas. Uh, next to Jeff then is Dan Clancy, who I think possibly needs no introduction by now. Um, but if you like, uh, well, well, Je uh, he is, of course, uh, engineering director of the Google Books. He actually will be speaking last, but the position on the panel, I'll introduce him next. Uh, as he says, uh, working to bring offline content online and make it searchable to allow discovery of books. Uh, I'm also glad to note that he previously worked, I think if I'm right, at NASA Ames, working to go back to space. As when I criticize some aspects of people, um, of, of Google Books, people will say to me, they will end conversations by saying things like, I need to get back to the planet Earth now. I'm rather glad to have Dan <laughs> with me on this panel. <laughs> and finally is, again from the iSchool, Cliff Lynch, um, who is um, the director for the, of the Coalition for Networked Information. Uh, he was before that, I think, for 18 years at the office of the president of the University of California overseeing um, the, uh, basically the, the online, the, the library going online here at Berkeley, maybe one of the best ways to describe it. Um, I need to say about Cliff is that it's very good to have him here because it's what he has to say is always enormously enlightening, but also he's very good to come because he's actually teaching at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So if he suddenly slips away before the panel is over, no one should take it personally. <laughs> uh, let me just say a couple of words by way of introduction. Um, this is a sort of particular interest of mine. I must say when Pam asked me to put together a panel on quality, I was slightly hesitant. Um, because in part having uh, with Jeff taught a course on the quality of information uh, and done some writing about the quality of information of various online sources. I have been a sort of magnet for some splendid insults. Um, and in particular, questioning the, questioning the quality of Google Books does bring down on your head the wrath of almost everyone you can imagine. Um, the, you know, I've been called petty and small-minded and bibliographically fastidious. Um, <laughs> uh, I was even quite recently called a librarian, and I think that was regarded as one of the worst things that you could say to people. Um, I think uh, there's three things I'd like to sort of mention in this. Uh, one is the sort of constant phrase, 
by the grand futurist visions, and I have great futurist visions for what the library of the future will be like, but people like to say things like, you just don't get it. The other thing is that you're incurably romantic and have this longing for leather-bound books. And then the last is that you're just this antediluvian monster. Um, let me try to say three <laughs> things about those. The first is that you just don't get it notion. And sometimes I feel, and even this morning sitting here, I just don't get it. Because quite what it is, is never always clear. The Google project I find to be one of the most remarkably chameleon affairs I've come across. When you look at it, sometimes it seems to be claiming, or people will claim for it, that it's a library. And we've had some of those discussions read the library this morning, and that brings with it a great deal of our sort of warm feeling towards libraries. But when you look at it and say, well, will you behave, whether about privacy or whether about, as we will talk today, metadata, they suddenly say, no, no, we're not really a library. You can't think we're a library. And then they become, well, what? They become a commercial database, or they become a bookstore, and that's their interest, or they become some kind of just general philanthropic public trust concern, but then they'll move back from that again and once more become the cold-headed business people that you want to talk to. Now, this is partly because when you want to take a lot of books and do something with them, quite what you are, as Dan has said today, isn't clear even to you. But I do think that there are times when we need to hold Google's feet to the fire and say, well, what are you trying to do? Now, Dan again has said to me, and I, and I say very much, that you know, they have to choose among priorities. Well, that's fine, but I want to say, well, so do we. And if our priorities aren't the same as yours, we should speak up loud, whatever the insults might be. Um, so that's the sort of you just don't get it question. The romanticist question, um, I, I think, is, is intriguing uh, in many ways because I often find it seems to me it's the people at Google who are the most romantic of all. I think some of their ideas about what a book and what a library is, um, they see books. I think they have taken books in many ways, and Dan knows this, I've said it to him before. They, they take books as fairly well-defined, easy to categorize and understand artifacts, and they're not. Books are monstrous. They're awkward, difficult, problematic in so many ways, and that word, and Jeff has written about this, just encapsulates a whole lot of very sloppy and problematic stuff. Um, and the final thing then, I think, is the accusation of being antediluvian. And one of the things about this panel is we will in part be looking back rather than looking forward. People have talked today about what will the library of the future become. But one of the things that I asked the panelists to think about is, if we are being asked, for one reason or another, to give Google certain kinds of indemnity or privileged access, we want to say, how have they done so far? Is what they've done so far sufficient reason to say they should be given a free hand to go forward from here? And that's one of the questions I'd like the panel to address. And with that, first go to Mark. Okay, this is on? I think so. Right. That's on. This, uh, there, there it goes. Okay. So uh, I uh, first learned about what was then called Google Print um, back towards the end of 2004, not too long after it was first announced. And uh, I first wrote in enthusiastic support mm -hmm. of Google Print against the uh, um, uh, harsh words uh, um, that came against it from certain people in France, a man named Junenet, and Jacques Chirac supported him. Um, and over the years since then, in dozens of blog posts, I've exhibited the fact that I remain an enthusiastic user today. Uh, I think I use Google Books nearly every day, um, not quite as much as I use Google, but I'm very, very glad that Google has done it, and I look forward to continuing to be a user. Um, but I think there's a, a perspective that it's very important to keep in mind, as good as Google Books is for us as individual users searching for and reading individual books, um, there is another potential here. Um, a digital library is a kind of proxy universe in which you can do in silico studies of the historical dynamics of language and culture. 
And I would predict that as a result, data mining large scale samples of textual history will transform scholarship in many areas of the humanities and social sciences um, in ways that are very difficult to predict today. Um, to give one very parochial example, um, uh, something that I've worked on a little bit myself in collaboration with others at, other researchers at Penn and elsewhere, uh, empirical work on the history of the English language over the last 500 years now depends on a body of historically dated texts that amounts to about a million words, not quite evenly distributed over the last half millennium. Um, the data in Google Books potentially increases this by five or six orders of magnitude. Um, with a potential effect comparable to the invention of the telescope or the microscope on 17th century science. A friend of mine, who perhaps not coincidentally is now at Google, um, once remarked to me about not quite 10 years ago um, that he felt as though he was an astronomer and Google had the only telescope. Uh, that was not talking about Google Books, that was before Google Books, but it was with respect to large web collections um, other people have since found ways to uh, um, scrape the web and produce collections of roughly comparable size. So Google not, no longer owns the only telescope uh, in that case, but we're talking about a different kind of instrument and one where there may be for some time something approximating a monopoly situation that, that may be difficult to overcome. Um, overall, the scale of Google's dig digitization effort is extremely impressive, and it's amazing that uh, Google is able to provide such high-quality search for free to so many people. One problem is that scholars of various kinds, from computational linguists to um, people interested in the history of ideas, are, of course, not a very significant part of the market that Google relies on to pay the bills. And so I would argue that for the same reason that net neutrality was essential to the development of the internet, there are reasons to worry that a private commercial monopoly in the area of the written history of uh, culture um, might strangle the transformation of scholarship in its cradle or at least significantly retard its development. The first problem, the first quality issue here is that it's really important that basic bibliographic information, who wrote what when, is mostly correct. Obviously, there's going to be some noise in any collection, but you want, in general, um, the results to correspond approximately to what the metadata says they should be. Um, it's very difficult for us on the outside to figure out what the overall quality the sort of average quality of Google Books is. It's very easy to find horrible examples. And I've had some personal connection in, in the context of the historical work done by Erez Lieberman and Jean-Baptiste Michel at Harvard that uh, Dan Clancy mentioned earlier um, to see what happens when one tries to do a significant historical slice and look in detail at the quality of the dating of the texts involved. Um, but so I thought uh, for today I would pick a couple of search terms and dates and just look to see what I got. So if we search for Berkeley in 1899, obviously most of the things that we find are going to be about the philosopher, not about um, the university, uh, although there are a few about the university. Um, but as we move down the list, we find some things that are suspicious. A short history of modern philosophy from Descartes to Wittgenstein, um, who had not become a famous philosopher by 1899. <laughs> uh, or down a little bit further, Machines Who Think, a personal inquiry into the history and prospects of etc. by Pamela McCorduck. Um, so this, is, uh, this book, I believe, was actually published in 2003 or something like that. Um, Here's a, uh, let's put that one away. Um, if we search for UCLA in 1899, since UCLA was, ca was called something like Southern California Normal School or something like that at that point, uh, we don't really expect to find any genuine hits. And in fact, what we do get are nevertheless quite a, a fair number of books that are definitely not from 1899. Um, if we search for 
uh, Berkeley in 1930, um, we don't see on the first page anything that looks really bad, but in fact, if we look in more detail at, for example, this bibliographical memoirs thing, we find that we can buy it from Amazon, and, and Google knows that we can buy it from Amazon, and Amazon knows that it was actually published in 2000, on November 13th. So I won't, I, I've queued up some other things, but, hello, how do I get, there we go. Uh, I won't uh, click them all. Uh, I'll just click one more of them, namely Google in 1899. <laughs> and again, we find a certain number of books, uh, none of which are actually published in 1899. Now, this is not actually because Google didn't exist in 1899, although that's true. Um, it's actually because there's something special about 1899. There, seem, there seems to have been at least one source of data in Google Books where everything was said to have been published in 1899. I don't know just what it is. So if we look for Google in 1898, then we find you know, something about the War of the Rebellion, a compilation of the official records of the Union, which references private David Google, and a, something called Goff versus Google, which actually was a, from a case in 1899, and so on. Uh, so, and likewise for 1900, so there was something kind of special about 1899, but th the point is that there's a lot of this sort of stuff in the database, and I'm not trying to beat up on Google. Uh, I think Jeff is going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just <laughs> pointing out that there's, that, that from, the per from the parochial point of view of someone interested in the history of language or the history of ideas and interested in doing data mining rather than reading individual works, there's a certain amount of work to do to curate uh, the corpus, let's say. And I think uh, this, the, for people who are reading individual books, this sort of thing, as long as it's kept to a reasonable level probably doesn't matter very much. It doesn't affect their search experience enormously. Um, but it does matter to scholars and to computational, to computer scientists. And so I think there's, there are reasons to ask questions about will, you know, what sorts of efforts will go on internally in Google to fix these things up? Will improvements made internal to Google be passed through to the research corpus that we've heard about? Will there be a process for curating the research corpus and will those results be shared between the two sites and passed back to Google, et cetera? Um, how will all of that be kept consistent, if at all? Um, but there's a second quality pr problem, which I think is really a quality problem. It was mentioned this morning in the data mining panel. Researchers, or rather researchers' programs, really need access to the underlying data, not just a peek through the keyhole of a search interface designed for other purposes. Um, now, the proposed settlement allows for this through the creation of the research corpus that will be available in two locations. But from what I can tell, that solution from, the, from my parochial perspective as a researcher is only a little bit better than nothing. I've had lots of collaborations in the past with students and colleagues and um, interns and so on who worked at Google on projects. And those have been very rewarding and very successful. But there's a big difference between that kind of arm's length collaboration and having the data on your own machine. OK, I'm almost done here. Um, and it's worse if you have to submit a proposal and then be told that you'll have six hours between 2 in the morning and 8 in the morning on February 13th, 2011, in order to run your program. Or what, I don't know, I'm, I probably the the arrangements will be more flexible than that, but there's going to be a lot of people interested in these research corpora, and it, there's a very good chance, I think, that there's going to be a, a mismatch between supply and demand of the sort that exists with particle accelerators and telescopes and so on, and I think, that, I, I think there's a good chance that that really will hold back research. That isn't Google's responsibility the way things are set up. That will be the fault of Michigan and Berkeley or wherever the two research sites are, but it would be a shame if the only way to access this corpus would be through a process like that, which is especially unfortunate since the text of several million books properly curated would easily fit on cheap portable media. A million books times 
100,000 words a book times uh, 10 bytes per word, I'm sorry, that should be, um, is about 100 gigabytes. Um, it's just not a very large, I mean, still takes a while to work through it and so on, but from the point of view of distrib distributing it, it's not like you need a truck to, to distribute it. So I asked a question which I've been thinking about for a while, which is could the uncopyrighted pre-1922 and government portion of the research corpus be distributed more widely? And according to Dan Clancy, there's nothing in the agreement to prevent it, and there's nothing in the copyright law to prevent it, but Google management isn't ready to do it for reasons that make perfect sense. They feel that they've invested tens of millions of dollars in doing the scanning, and they don't want to see somebody else making money from it. And you could make people who get the data sign a user agreement saying that they won't use it in certain ways. But of course, people um, uh, go against agreements that they sign all the time. And Google certainly doesn't want to be in the position of having to sue such people. So um, I'm almost done here. I just want to uh, make a, a proposal or a suggestion, which is that there are there are, I, there would, I think, be, if Google were willing to do it, fairly easy ways to solve this problem, or at least to ameliorate this problem. The Linguistic Data Consortium, which I direct, has already published two large and widely used text collections created by researchers at Google containing data that Google didn't own, but provided under the fair use provision for research purposes. And we're in discussions to publish another one. Over the past 20 years, we've published copyrighted material owned by hundreds of commercial publishers, broadcasters, and writers. Large-scale case in point, the New York Times annotated corpus, which is basically every article that the New York Times published between 1987, I believe, and 2007, um, with all of the uh, metadata that their editors added to it, people, places, organizations, topic headings, and so on. Um, and we'd, we'd be happy to mediate uh, a distribution that could really serve the needs of researchers, and I'm sure there are other organizations who would be happy to do it. I don't insist that we do it. This isn't directly connected to the settlement at all, if I understand it. That is, as Dan explained to me, there's nothing in the settlement, as well as nothing in copyright law, that would prevent um, this kind of wider distribution to scholars. Um, but if Google were willing to allow that kind of broader access to the data, starting with the uncopyrighted portions, in ways that would permit real research to go forward expeditiously, in my opinion, the public good aspect of the process would be gooder. <laughs> Um, so I, I really want to just pick up uh, some of the themes um, Mark, uh, Mark developed. Um, <coughs> speaking, as, um, speaking as someone who has used uh, uh, Google and, and, and Google Books as a scholar, in addition to, like all of us, uh, just in, in the interest of finding everyday information. Um, and I'm particularly interested in whether Google Books, as it's constituted now, answers to the needs of scholars. Um, for whom, as Mark said, this um, uh, could be this, this extraordinary boon. Um, <coughs> I think that the crucial thing to bear in mind is this is likely to be the last library. Nobody's very likely to scan all these books again. The cost of scanning isn't going to come down. There's no Moore's Law for, 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 for capture. Uh, and leaving aside even the, the, the orphan works, these are the, we don't know who's going to be running these files 100 years from now, maybe Google, maybe News Corp, maybe Walmart, maybe UNESCO. It's impossible to know. But, but we, we can uh, say with some certitude that these are the very files that scholars are going to be looking at of these sources uh, 100 years from now. Um, and because of that, because this is the last library, the, uh, it invests all of these concerns about privacy, about access, about exclusivity, about pricing, and about quality with an especial urgency. Um, <coughs> So whose interests determine quality when we talk about quality? Um, uh, Derek Slater at Google um, uh, dis described Google Book Search as a tremendous public good for students, for teachers, for scholars, for everyone. I have no argument with any of the, the clauses of that, of that statement. But students, scholars, 
and everyone may have very different purposes in, in using Google Book Search. Um, for most people, uh, using Google, uh, the, 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 the chief use of, of Google Book Search uh, is what we have come to describe as Googling. Uh, I mean, to, to Google uh, is, to, is to throw in some keywords and, and see what pops up. It's not to work your way down a hierarchical data structure uh, to, to, to find something. Um, and that seems to be the use to which um, Google imagines most people will be putting GBS. In fact, that they'll be thinking of it it's just as a, a borough of greater Google or, or Google.com. Uh, Sergey Brin says, we feel this is just part of our core mission, Google Books. Uh, there's fantastic information in books. Often when I do a search, what is in a book is miles ahead of what I find in a website. So this is a way of augmenting uh, the, the, the amount of information that's available via, via Google for, for, for searching. We all use Google that way, and we will all use or all do use Google Books that way. But there are other uses to which it may be put and to which particular scholars may be interested in putting it, um, where the interest is not particularly in finding a piece of information, um, but rather in seeking out uh, particular works and editions, for example, um, what, uh, what people at Google have sometimes described as the destination experience. Uh, that comprehends a scholar who's looking for a particular edition of Leaves of Grass, say. You're not just going to punch in, I contain multitudes, and hope that that edition comes up. You need, you need some way to find it. Uh, a good edition of Tristram Shandy, 18th century French editions of Don Quixote, and, 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 and so on. All of the uses to which you can imagine putting this repository. If you have good metadata, if you can identify editions and dates and authors and so on with, with some accuracy. Um, <coughs> the third, um, which Mark was talking about, which has come under the heading of, of data mining, I think of just more broadly as, as batch processing, so as to comprehend both data mining and what I think of as electronic philology, this extraordinary um, ability that we have now to use these large corpora to find out information about the history and development and of, of, of words. Um, linguists have been using this for a long time, Google for a long time, uh, for, for web search in an effort to find patterns of use. And we're always complaining that they, the hit counts are inaccurate and the hit count algorithms are, don't, don't give you reliable hit counts. And, uh, Peter Norvig, who at that time I think was director of research, was his title at Google, said, oh, well, it's only reporters and computational linguists who care if hit count estimates are, are right. Now, Peter's somebody who's paid his dues as a computational linguist and is not trying to slight the field. But when you come to uh, Google Book, uh, the, the public for this kind of activity, though, though very, still very small relative to the, the public for Google Book, is considerably larger. Uh, it includes not just linguists and computational linguists, but historians, uh, 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 social, intellectual, political historians, um, numerous people in literary study. One of the interesting things that's been going on in uh, the world of literature in, in the recent decades is this growth of this phrase, the new philology, or really I should say the new philologies, because this term is being used everywhere from by feminist theories to medievalists to Mesoamerican historians. But in, in every case, a, a return to an interest in empirical investigations of language. Uh, and either serendipitously or, or uh, not, uh, this is emerging at the same time you've got these enormous text databases come, becoming available. So you can do this kind of research uh, with new tools and, and, uh, and, and, and <coughs> vastly improved data uh, to work with. Um, and so you can ask all these questions. Uh, 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 Keith Thomas, an Oxford historian, wrote a book not long ago when I was, I was reading it. He's, he's talking about the end. It's called The Ends of Life. He's talking about how people saw the purpose of life. He says there was this shift in the middle of the 17th century, and one way you can tell that is that people left off talking about felicity and started up talking about happiness. Very interesting observation. Thomas has been reading all his life. I'm sure he's right. But it would be interesting to be able to evaluate that by looking at, at text databases for that period. Uh, uh, you could plot the rise and fall of the term of propaganda, something I've been interested in doing, or how did liberalism spread in the early 19th century context, or how did the meaning of imperialism shift over the late 19th century. You can imagine just every field of history and, and, and uh, literary studies might, might want to do this sort of thing. To do this, though, um, <coughs> uh, you, you, you have certain standards of quality that, that uh, you have to come up to. Um, the quality of imaging, one subject that has gotten attention, uh, the reliability and robustness of the search tools themselves, the hit counts, and so on, and the quality and reliability of metadata, uh, information about the date, the edition, the history, the author, the subject classification, and so forth. 
For these last purposes, unfortunately, uh, Google, uh, GPS's metadata are awful, um, or not terribly good, let me put it that way. <laughs> uh, now, as I said, people have complained, for example, about the quality of scans, and there are all these problems of the famous pictures of thumbs uh, appearing on the scan pages, blurred pages, uh, pages in which the OCRs run from right to left. Mark uh, Liverman dug this up a while ago. He, he noticed that there was a keyword, there was a, a a, 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 a keyword in the book that kept repeating that was just a, a random string of syllables, and he realized that it was uh, letters, and that was because the book had been scanned and then run right to left. Uh, book titles public, uh, printed upside down, and so forth. But what I want to talk about are, are the metadata issues that, um, that Mark brought up. Um, <coughs> first of all, the problem of dating. As Mark mentioned, 1899 is particularly problematic, I think, for one reason, there's a large corpus of Portuguese language data that are all dated, uh, 1899. Nonetheless, even outside of that, uh, if you look at that date to see what books Google ascribes to, to that date as having been published in that date, you see it's a Raymond Chandler, Raymond Williams' uh, um, classic uh, Culture and Society, 1780-1950, Mal Rowe, Dorothy Parker, Stephen King, John Steinbeck, Virginia Woolf, Yellow Submarine. Um, <coughs> and it, it's not only uh, that date, um, as Mark said. Um, uh, here's a work, book on Peter Drucker, uh, ascribed to 1905. Uh, James What Maisie Knew, ascribed to 1848. It's actually, I think, 1897. Uh, Virginia Woolf's Letters, 1900. Uh, Tom Woolf's The Bonfire of the Vanities, 1888, and so on. Um, <coughs> it's important to understand that these are not, I mean, that you have a huge database here. It's easy to, to find mistakes and uh, classification and, and, and dating errors. These things are pervasive and endemic in the database. Um, um, some ways of showing that. Mark did this with Google. I'll, I'll do it the same thing. There are 520 hits returned if you search on internet uh, books published before 1950. Um, uh, take the name of virtually any famous writer or figure and look for books published before the birth date of that person. For Charles Dickens, you come out with 182 hits. For Jimi Hendrix, 81. For Led Zeppelin, uh, 59, of course, that might have been another Led Zeppelin. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> um, this, is, this is an experiment anybody can do in the, in, the, in the privacy of his or her bedroom to give a sense of just how pervasive these dating mistakes are. Another way to make that point, uh, I, I couldn't resist surfing, doing some ego surfing in the Edgar Cayce <laughs> style to look for books uh, mentioning me and some of my colleagues um, before our birth dates or before our, uh, our active dates. Howard Rheingold, our colleague, his virtual community, uh, 1899. Uh, Steve Pinker mentions me in a book published in 1899. Paul Duguid's book from 1899. Um, Carla Hesse, um, who will be on the next panel, uh, scooped us all. She goes back to um, uh, 1884. And poor Annalise Saxenian had to wait until 1971 uh, to achieve public recognition. But then she's always been a kind of a slow starter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another demonstration I was doing, this, these are most, almost all searches I was doing for some independent reason. I was looking to see, uh, looking at the history of the word candy, the phrase candy bar. Um, took all the hits for candy bar from before 1920, there were 66. How many of them were actually from before 1920? Um, uh, only about 30% of them. 70% were, were misstated, maybe more. I didn't look at the ones that were all, all the ones that uh, were, were from before. B b the, where the date was before 1920 to see if that was actually the accurate date before 1920. Uh, a 70% rate seems to me quite high. I don't think it's that high in general, but it's, it's not 1% or 2%. Uh, it's for, for, for at least for these periods and these corpora, um, the rate is, is, is huge, and the number of texts involved <clears throat> is at least in the hundreds of thousands, if not more. Um, Classification errors, um, assignments of subject ca categories. Th 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 it's rife with these as well. Um, uh, uh, a French edition of Hamlet under antiques and collectibles, uh, um, a Japanese edition of uh, Madame Bovary under antiques and collectibles. I'll come back to that category in a moment. Uh, Speculum, uh, the journal of the medieval, it's the sort of standard medievalist journal uh, under health and fitness. <laughs> A biography of Mae West, this is my favorite, under religion. <laughs> and a book about uh, Australian feminist uh, thought under foreign language study. Um, uh, 
more uh, The Merchant of Venice under Foreign Language Study, The Century Dictionary under Family and Relationships, a book on volcanism, I mean, vul vul volcanic eruptions under Foreign Language Study, a book, a, a catalog of copyright entries under drama. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that was Google's little joke. <laughs> Uh, again, to get a sense of how per pervasive this is, uh, take the first 10 hits for Tristram Shandy. Um, four are assigned the category family and relationships, four to fiction, one to biography and autobiography, and one unlabeled. Actually, the unlabeled category is the, is the, is the one that's underrepresented there, because huge <laughs> numbers of these things are just un un unlabeled. Others are classified as music, as history, as literary collections, uh, and, and so forth. Um, the first 10 hits for Leaves of Grass, classified as juvenile nonfiction, poetry, fiction, literary criticism, biography, and autobiography, and for some reason, counterfeits and counterfeit. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one more example, uh, Jane Eyre uh, is classified variously as an, an autobiography, uh, a history, governesses, love stories, well, I guess, uh, architecture, and antiques and collectibles. Um, <laughs> which leads to the, the assumption that she must have said, reader, I marketed him. <laughs> um, other metadata issues, books ascribed to the authors of the introductions rather than the authors. Uh, so you see a copy of Madame Bovary ascribed to that great 19th century French novelist, Henry James. Um, um, uh, titles linked to utterly unrelated related works, a, a, a user guide to Mosaic, the old navigator, uh, ascribed to Sigmund Freud and Catherine Jones. Um, I, my sense of how that happened, that particular one happened, is that Jones translated Freud's 1939 Moses and Monotheism. Somehow Moses became Mosaic, and Mosaic was reassigned to the name of the browsers. I, mean, I have no idea how it happened in, in, in detail, but that must have been the story. Moreover, er errors of this sort constitute only a fraction of, of the bad metadata. There are lots of metadata assignments that aren't out and out wrong. Uh, if you have Jane Eyre under governesses, you say, well, yeah, I guess. You could have Moby Dick under Wales, and there is such an entry. Uh, <laughs> but it's maybe not the whole story about those works. Um, <clears throat> so to ask um, the, the question that always arises at times of revolutionary upheaval, who is to blame and what is to be done? Um, well, Google for a while was saying, well, look, we get the metadata from, from the libraries. Uh, and so it's by, by implicitly their fault. Well, that is, sometimes that's true. Clearly, um, uh, uh, as, I, as, as I mentioned, there's this large collection of uh, Portuguese texts that are all dated 1899 and, and so forth. But libraries didn't classify Hamlet as antiques and collectibles uh, or speculum as health and fitness. Um, for one thing, uh, I mean, th there's lots of reasons why these things happen. But for, for one thing, libraries don't use headings like antiques and collectibles and health and fitness in the first place. Um, those are BISAC categories from the book industry um, <clears throat> classification system, a much smaller classification system with about 2,000 uh, categories in all. That's used by the publishers to tell $8 an hour clerks where to put sh books on the shelves of uh, suburban Barnes & Noble. Um, uh, <coughs> um, what Google has been doing, and I, the source of a lot of these, uh, a lot of these errors, I suspect, is in um, trying to automate the conversion of, uh, of these records to BISAC categories, um, using maybe as a learning set the books they get from the publishers. Um, uh, because they've decided for some reason that these are, this is the category system that they um, want to use uh, for, for, for Google Books. Maybe because the publishers want it. Maybe because Google sees itself as in this line of work uh, at, at, at some point. In any event, it's a catastrophic decision. Um, it's a catastrophic decision because this is a system made for, as I say, organizing the shelves of a Barnes & Noble. You look at the classifications for juvenile nonfiction, there are about 215 of them, uh, in, and they, they, they ramify down fairly finely. There's one for juvenile nonfiction, animals, deer, moose, and caribou. So just Bambi and Bullwinkle get their own, get their own shelves. Um, when you come to poetry, there are only 20 subcategories in all, subheadings in all. And there's just one for continental European poetry. So Petrarch and Schiller and Berlin have to kind of punch, scrunch together on one shelf of the, of the bookstore. Well, that's the way it is in my local Barnes and Noble. Um, but it's not the way it is at the Berkeley um, uh, uh, Library, uh, the University Library. And it's certainly not the way it should be in this library of 10 million collections representing scholarly works and out of, day, uh, out of, uh, 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 out of copyright works and, and so on. Um, what's happened in effect is that 
Google has taken this collection of all the, the research libraries and returning it to people in the form of a suburban bookstore. Um, uh, Google says, um, and doubtless Dan will want to talk about this, well, we're on this. We know that there are problems which we're working on. It's not, to be frank, a priority. <coughs> um, they haven't quite indicated how they're going about this. Um, on bad scans, they've said we're going to correct them as they come in, as they're brought to our attention. Uh, it may be that this is what they're doing here. Certainly, I know that when individual cases like this are brought to their attention, they do correct them. Paul has had this experience. Um, but there are hundreds of thousands, at least, of metadata errors here. Uh, and doing them on a one-by-one -one basis just isn't a, a practical way of going about it. Um, moreover, just correcting errors doesn't address uh, these problems of poor and missing metadata, inconsistent or confusing or inappropriate classification schemes. Um, and in fact, one wants to ask, if this is the universal library and the last library, why should the decisions about how it's going to be classified be left to Google's engineers, as smart and, 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 and well-intentioned as, as they are? Um, is uh, HathiTrust uh, uh, the answer? Well, they've got a bunch of these manuscripts. They're talking about doing full text search. Um, it's not clear what functionalities they will offer, to whom. Uh, in any event, they'll only have, for the foreseeable future, the out-of-copyright works. Um, <coughs> and in any event, why should Google have no contractual obligations to do Google Book Search right? Um, if it is a tremendous public good, uh, as Derek Slater said, it also implies, and this is a point that Pam Samuelson has made, uh, a tremendous public trust. I'm going to be brief following those two, um, but I think you'll hear some of the th same themes emerge in some of my comments. I want to draw a slightly broader frame around this um, as we think about quality here. And I am going to focus narrowly on the topic of quality. Um, as you can see from the program here, there are many, many other issues that one might reasonably take up. And I am going to focus on it kind of in the context of the settlement. I think one of the reasons why many of us are worried about the settlement and are here is because it feels like something is happening here that is much bigger than a simple legal settlement. We're really making sort of um, cultural and national policy about how we're going to manage what um, uh, Jeff just very eloquently spoke of as perhaps the last library, perhaps the closest approximation that we'll see for many, many years to a universal library, and that it's really important to get that right. Now, I just want to reflect on a couple of specific elements of quality, and then I want to come back at the end and put this into a bigger perspective. You saw a lot of examples of problems, mostly with metadata, in some cases with um, uh, optical character recognition. The optical character recognition we know is kind of a, you know, error-prone process. It's one that slowly gets better as people correct it and as the algorithms improve. I find the metadata issue um, much less excusable. If we think of this last library um, as collecting up books that are already there, that we already have a very elaborate system of bibliographic control for, including methods to correct errors in a kind of a collective basis and to harness a large number of very skilled people around the country and indeed around the world. Um, it's striking how we failed to connect this on an ongoing basis to that bibliographic apparatus. I think that that is a, a prominent failure. And that when we think about 
how to deal with some of the problems that Jeff speaks, um, did, that Jeff demonstrated, uh, that is uh, one of the very important routes in. There's a very substantial problem, and we've seen a little taste of it with addition management, and um, Paul certainly has uh, written on this in the past, but one of the things that we're finding here is that as we digitize these collections, they bring up vast assortments of different editions of variant quality. How we cluster that and how we rank things there is going to be very critical, I think. And this is a place where I think Google has tried to make a very good start by listing um, all of the additions of a work, but I think we need a lot more effort in that area, especially for classic kinds of works. And we probably need more transparency in what's going on there. One of the things that's interesting, um, uh, Jeff um, shared uh, some of his examples with me a couple of days ago, um, and I took a look at some of them, is that they, um, in, in some cases, look like they're coming from publisher data rather than bibliographic data. Um, and I think that, um, that kind of emphasizes some of the issues here. We've got three kinds of things mixed up together in this, this uh, database. We've got data that exists, um, that's produced by OCR on kind of a you know, unambiguous basis. Um, it is what it is. We've got assertions made through bibliographic metadata, and we've got assertions made through publisher metadata. And um, particularly in the publisher area, I'm not clear how that's maintained and how updates to that are fed in. Let me touch on one other kind of specific area that we haven't talked about very much. And that's what's in the database. I think that what we've seen up till now is a set of policies that have looked to grow the database and to reach out to many different major library collections and to look for more sources of unique material to cover more and more of the corpus of, um, of uh, published literature. Uh, today and all the way back into the past. Now, I think when we look forward and we think about this, con this database constituting and taking on this sort of universal library character, um, it gets to be a big deal what's in there and what's not in there and how things find their way in there and how things find their way out of the database for various reasons, either because people opt out for one reason or another, or um, Google decides to remove it for one reason or another, or someone makes them remove it for one reason or another. I think that the question of transparency, at the very least, and indeed maybe more than that, policies about inclusion and exclusion, especially as we move into a world where there is more and more self-publishing where the, the grip uh, of, of traditional publishers as kind of gatekeepers to the world of books is getting a little bit more tenuous. Um, I, I think we need to think carefully about these and I think these kinds of questions need to be part of the policy apparatus around quality for um, the Google Books uh, collection. Now, let me back up to some final and I think broader points that have been at least implicit in the earlier statements. In some sense, there's no money in libraries. There's no money in <laughs> quality. There's no money in supporting the rather esoteric needs of humanities researchers, of computational linguistics. I think that to really give credit where credit due is due, the notion of creating and partially funding the research corpus is a, is a very honest and well-intentioned effort to get at that, but the fact that it's limited um, strongly to data mining 
I think, um, uh, reduces its utility. We really need a books database that holistically recognizes quality, recognizes the needs of this kind of scholarly work, and we need some uh, way of aligning incentive and facilitating collective investment here. Um, it's really unreasonable to go and beat up on Google, which after all is a profit-making corporation, about the fact that they're not spending enough on things that don't make any money. Um, that's why you have cultural memory organizations. That's why you have foundations that advance the humanities. That's why you have um, government entities that fund work in this area. And I think we need to think very hard about whether particularly for the public domain material, for things that are being placed in the public domain or put under, um, uh, under Creative Commons license, perhaps for the orphans, whether we shouldn't be trying to set that aside in some framework that really permits that kind of collective investment. I think that relying on Google to do the right thing is a very unreasonable burden for Google. Um, we heard the analogy in the first session today of the collection of literature, of books, as being in some sense a, piece, a major piece of the cultural genome. That's an analogy that I think has some, um, some, some deep resonance. And it's actually instructive to look at the debate about the human genome. There were actually parallel programs to privatize the human genome and to make it available publicly. They ran in competition for a while, and uh, we really had to sort out the role of public <coughs> investment there. I think one of the things that we are looking at in certain sense here is a failure of public investment and the consequences of it as we try and sort through how to align incentives in this. And I think that perhaps as we struggle with what we really want from the Google Book Settlement, what we really want in order to ensure a continued investment in quality and in support of scholarship, we don't need to be backing off and thinking about whether we shouldn't be at least treating the truly public part of the cultural genome, the public domain material especially, in some somewhat different way. I think that, as um, was indicated, We've already heard this is a bit orthogonal to the settlement itself, but I think that when we cast thinking about the settlement in the framework of making cultural and public policy, this is not an unreasonable thing to be thinking about. Thanks. So, so much to respond to in so little time. Um, so I mean, I'm going to go back to where Paul started. And in fact, Paul, Paul used some of the colorful language that uh, people had described. And I think, Paul, you'll probably acknowledge that I've never been one to use any of those adjectives. Is that correct? I don't you, think I have. You, you use colorful about my language, which I thought you meant uh, I was trading in obscenities. No. <laughs> um, um, and part of this, I'll go to um, uh, you know, some of the, and, and we've talked about some issues, metadata, but, and there are other ones we haven't talked about. And I'll use an analogy. Um, you know, so with my daughter, um, I'll, you know, she'll be doing a bunch of stuff and I'm all excited and then she does something that I don't like and I'll tell her that and then she says, well, you don't love me, Daddy. And I say, no, it doesn't mean I don't love you. In fact, it's because I love you that I'm doing this. And so, um, in fact, you know, if I take some of Paul's criticism, um, I realize that some of the most vocal critics are also the most avid users of the product. Okay, and so in fact, um, I think it's important to understand that dialogue and criticism is a healthy thing, and it's a good thing because that's how we all stay sharp. Okay, now in this, and I do think this is an important part, and I think um, uh, at least in 
in my email exchanges with Paul, I've always felt pretty good about the exchange, about the, um, uh, you know, trying to think through problems. Because part of this is also the degree to which of the tone. Meaning, is this about identifying problems and then thinking through solutions and thinking through of understanding different perspectives and engaging in dialogue and understanding how as a community we can solve problems as opposed to creating what I'll call as a dichotomy, you know, of you're not doing everything I want you to do, so therefore you're bad. Rather, there are some things that you could do better, there's some things that we could do better, and how do we move forward, okay? Um, and I think this is really important as we start talking about quality here. Um, I actually don't view Google Book Search as the one and only library, okay? I don't think it should be, and I don't think it will be. Um, in part because, remember, a, a library is about accessing information, not just accessing books. I mean, libraries were created because books were where information was in the past. Library is about information, and as we go 10, 15, 20 years from now, Google is not the only digitization activity in existence today. There will continue to be other activities, and part of it, and really, the Internet provides all sorts of information. That, are, that is linked together in lots of different ways. So um, I also don't think that every time I scan a book, oh no, this is the last time this book will ever be scanned. There may be some books like that. But to the extent that Google Book Search is our last shot, if that were really true, then it's probably also true that if not for Google Book Search, we never would have had a shot, which I don't think necessarily is true. Um, now, going to some of the metadata issues, um, uh, which I think is an important, an important topic. Um, there were a number of different types of metadata issues that Jeff talked about. One was the BISEC um, and the um, classification. The other was the date of publication. Okay? Um, and what we do with metadata is we combine metadata. We get metadata from libraries. We get metadata from OCLC. And we do get metadata from commercial partners as well, Ingram, Baker and Taylor, Balker, a number of commercial partners. Um, for books we scan with a library, we get it from the library. Okay? So invariably when you see a snippet view book and you see wrong metadata, we got that metadata from the library in terms of the data publication. Okay? Um, and in fact, we have a system, when Cliff mentioned why it's not integrated with the existing infrastructure to do this, it is actually. We get updates from the libraries and we get updates. We get updates every, every week or two with new metadata to help correct the errors that were in there. The interesting thing is for all the dates that we identify, um, many of those dates existed, almost all of them existed for sure in one of the sources that we got. Okay? Prior to full text search, we didn't know that there were these errors. It's only as we start searching these books that we're finding a lot of errors that the existing infrastructure sometimes did not detect. Okay? Now, with respect to the classification, um, uh, Jeffrey, I, I think Jeff does have a point that there may be some problems in terms of the um, BISAC versus the um, LCCN or other subject classifications that we have. Um, and, and in fact, I, I plan to look into that to see where we're getting the wrong metadata. I don't think it's inferred. I think it is from different sources. And it is very difficult to combine. We have over 80 million metadata records from lots of different sources. And the process of you know, combining all these together is a very difficult process okay? um, to figure out when two things are really the same thing versus not the same thing, which one is the authoritative source, which one is not the authoritative source. And the one thing I'm sure of is that we're not doing the combination as good as we could. Okay? And so part of this is you know, about the tone of figuring out to the extent that Google is falling short in its combination of metadata sources, okay, then we've always been very open to understanding of how we can do better because obviously we're not sitting here going, ha, 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 yes, I have this listed now as antiques and collectibles. Ha, ha, just what I've been trying for. Um, you know, there were engineers that worked on something that didn't quite get it good enough to what is a very hard problem, okay? The other part about this is to the extent the source of our data is part of the problem, which in many cases it is, okay, we need to be thinking collectively about ways that now as you have electronic access to information, how can we improve what had previously been limited in terms of the ability of doing the comparison of different libraries' holdings. 
It's very difficult when you're doing the shared collections that OCLC does to really figure out when this book that is held at Berkeley is the same book that is held at NYPL. And when one record is created here and one record is created here, how to merge them. Okay? This is a tough problem. I do think as we have digital access to books, it becomes much easier to fix some of these problems in a collaborative way. And again, part of this is not just about Google doing it. Okay? It's about other organizations doing it. And in fact, with our library partners, we've always been very forthright and encouraging that you know, we don't want a world where we're expecting Google to be the be all and end all, especially when it comes to the organization of, um, um, you know, of all the metadata and all the information and all the rich information, which is one reason why we have a number of open APIs to allow other people using their catalogs to link in and display the books within the context of their website. Okay? So um, uh, with metadata, there's more we should be doing or could be doing. But there's a lot more that we collectively also can be doing. And metadata is only the tip of the iceberg. You start talking about um, public domain determination. That's an area where there really needs to be collective effort. Um, one of the challenges we run into, if we trust the metadata that we get from libraries to determine whether or not to treat a book as public domain using 1923, our error rate would be atrocious. Okay? And we would be violating copyright right and left if we did that. Okay? We can't trust it in terms of treating public domain. Often we need to look at the books, and in fact, often we are overly conservative because we have automated techniques and people looking at the books that are not skilled bibliographers. They're not part of a library community that intimately can know, ah, uh, this book was published in 1898, and so we end up being conservative with some of those books that really should be in the public domain. So, you know, I think part of this is collectively thinking, how do we work together on this? Um, I want to go also to some of what Cliff talked about when he used the analogy um, uh, uh, of the human genome uh, race. And while sometimes it's always easy to take an analogy from something that has happened in the past, um, in the case of the human genome, you had one company that felt like it was a competition and in fact wanted to get there first and the degree to which one person got there first may or may not because of IP and all sorts of issues precluded what the next party could do because there was this attempt to patent different things, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And that is certainly not, as, not at all what is happening here. In fact, um, with respect to Google Book Search, you know, our approach here is very much we provide free access to the, the public domain works. We have, now we're allowing both PDF download and EPUB download. In fact, if you compare us to you know, many other initiatives in terms of digitizing public domain works, it's much more open. We have partnerships with Hopper <coughs> Trust, with Michigan, with our university libraries. They have the ability to share the content. Um, and so I've never viewed this as a competition between the for-profit entity and the not-for-profit initiative to see who can get there first. Okay, because I don't think that is, it's not as one gains, the other loses. In fact, I believe as a community, there's this question of how do you build a collective set of resources? And it's not just about one player. In fact, that's one reason why we are very encouraged with Michigan and Hathi Trust, with our library partners. Um, it's not just about Google. It's not just about Internet Archive. It's not just about Hathi Trust, right? It's really about trying to figure out how can you build a bunch of different repositories and how the fact that certain ones allow access and expose what they have available. One reason why we have some of our APIs is to tell you what can you read on Google Book Search, what can you preview, what can you get PDF download so that you can tell other people that. Um, and how do you ensure that from a preservation perspective these books are held in multiple places often, okay? And, and which is one thing, I know much of this actually has not been about the settlement, it's about the broader issues of a shared library community. And um, uh, one of the benefits I like about the settlement is the fact that we can give copies of books back to libraries even when we scan them with a different library because it creates replication, which is one of the first principles of preservation. Um, so interestingly enough, we didn't get to talk much about the scanning quality. Paul and I had a, a recent exchange on Read 2.0, which I thought that's what we'd talk more about. But, um, 
you know, as we go through the, you know, further discussion here, um, you know, I'd like to encourage us to think through of not thinking of Google and everyone else, but rather thinking a little more collectively because in the end, I don't think we are the only library. In fact, I think we're part of a broader community. Okay, thank you to all the panelists. We have about 25 minutes, I think, for questions. Is right, we finish at three o'clock, I think. Um, what I, I'd like to do, if I may, is um, if there's enough questions, if people put their hands up now, if they have questions, and if there are, maybe field a few questions before coming to the panel to answer them to, so, so that we can do it that way. So let's start first with Bob. And then Jim in the back there, so there's a second mic, thanks. And then a third for Karen there uh, after Bob. Okay, so that we've got three at least coming in. Let's begin with all three before we respond. Bob. Bob Glushko, School of Information. Uh, People were laughing at some of Jeff's uh, demonstrations of bad metadata. I was getting angrier and angrier as that was happening. Because I see there's been a very clever shift in the frame of reference here. This panel is put forth as if there are hundreds of millions of ordinary people who use Google. And there's sort of this fringe million people who are professors and researchers. And they have these sort of specialized concerns. And yeah, we're not doing so well for them, but you know what? They're a, they're a fringe group, practically. So we're going to amuse ourselves talking about it, but they don't really count to us. In fact, the right comparison should be the fact that Google is settling with 8,000 authors, and there's 800,000 professors and scholarly research, 100 times more of them, and you're ignoring our concerns, which is arrogant and contemptible. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. And Jim, please, do you have a mic? Yeah, uh, I, I'm interested in the uh, broader issue of who owns the metadata and what can be done to uh, improve it. Uh, so one of the issues here is that apparently the metadata is mostly owned by OCLC. And uh, so even, even if you have the research corpus available, the metadata of that corpus would not be available for the same kind of uh, machine processing. Could I have comments on that? Okay, so we've got that. That's incorrect. Metadata is owned by the library collaboratively and cooperatively with OCLC. OCLC acts like it owns it. Let's go back to that. Yeah. Well, that was my question as well, is is to what extent um, whether or not you have an agreement with OCLC and whether or not it allows you to use the full bibliographic data that you get from the libraries. Yeah. One in the front here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, did you get, please? Yeah, thank you. Oh, I was expecting somebody to answer. <laughs> oh, no, I think we're going to gather some questions and then oh, get okay. people to answer. The, um, uh, my question is, uh, I'll ask it rhetorically as a question and then you can interpret it as a comment. Oh, sorry, could, could you say who you are too? Please? Oh, I'm sorry. Edward Feigenbaum, Stanford Computer Science Department. Um, I was amazed at this uh, phrase that came out about the last library. I can't conceive of why this is the last library. And there's a piece of data that came out in this conversation that startled me, which is that Google spent, I think it was on one of the slides, Google spent tens of millions of dollars on this project. Tens of millions of dollars is a relatively small amount of money. I mean, uh, Microsoft buys little startup companies for $100 million. Uh, if this were a great business, and Microsoft has a great research lab. I mean. I love Google's research people, but Microsoft is just as good. Uh, why don't we think, I mean, why is this the last library? Okay, all right, so let, let's be begin with that as, as the first. So, so, so the two questions there about metadata, who owns it, who controls it. Um, one um, about whether this really is just a matter for sort of academics and whether they can be separated up on some side because they're such a small community, as Bob argues, actually a very large community. And in fact, I don't think it's only about academics. I've argued for a long time one of the hardest things to do on Google Books is if you find volume one of a book to find volume two of a book. <laughs> and that doesn't seem to me to be something of a particularly intense academic interest. No. Some people just want to read volume two. Um, so, uh, and then <laughs> finally, um, Ed Feigenbaum's question, which, uh, the, the question which came up, is this the last library? Uh, or what does Jeff mean by that? And I think one of the questions that comes out of that, if this is, 
in proportion to many other things, a relatively small sum of money that's being spent, then maybe you know, we should think of how we get that money to do it and maybe do it in a different way, uh, a competitive way, people talked about this morning, if that's right. So, please, uh, to the questions. The, uh, let's go first. Uh, to the idea of, is this an academic issue? Are we, in this quality panel, really just talking about... Uh, uh, I don't. I think that. I think that's. I, I, you know, I've never characterized. Oh, these are things that only matter to the academic community. I mean, it's it matters to general users as well. The data publication, the things like this. So, so I don't think this is just an academic question. And even to the extent it is an academic question, the academic market is a very big market, and in fact, much of the benefit of Google Book Search also is disproportionate to academics. So I, I don't think this is just a niche that's just academic. So. Okay. All right. You will find, if you complain about this in public, you will be told this is an academic issue. And but, an academic. But, but that's you what may even have noticed you. that in the past week, Dan. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, to the metadata question, uh, which is a critical one. Who owns it? Who controls it? What can be done about it? Who pays for it? Under what terms it could from? it be distributed? Under what terms can it be distributed? What terms can it be changed? Um, what, and who changes distributed? Uh, and who changes How are the changes distributed? One of the... Um, Interesting is the people at Michigan early on suggested when I pointed out to errors with Google is they well each library can that's contributing can bring back its books and they can recatalog them and I thought well that's a wonderful idea so you get one edition of Tristram Shandy from the 19th century of which there are 30 then it's scanned by Google so that becomes an extra edition it's distributed to 50 different libraries who all then make their own changes to that edition so now from one 19th century edition among 30 you end up with 150 editions all cataloged differently so there are some issues there over who has control over this Cliff you're uh, a man who knows about metadata maybe we could start with you um, okay um, I, I think that one of the um, I think that there is a lot of confusion about uh, who, who owns and controls and what can be done with the kind of big collective bibliographic database. And without you know, belaboring all the details, I'll simply note that um, there was an effort to develop a policy that was supposed to clarify that, which went uh, in my view, terribly awry, and that policy was, was withdrawn, um, and uh, OCLC is in the process of chartering a, a group to try and develop a more coherent policy. And very much part of the, that question there is the relationship between OCLC as a corporate entity, albeit a not-for-profit one, and the contributing libraries who've actually, you know, built that database in essence, and how the um, interests of those libraries align appropriately with OCLC. And actually, this is a very good case in point where it's clearly in the interest of the major research libraries to integrate this well with OCLC and to use OCLC as the way of co correcting errors in the aggregate metadata base, mm -hmm. which would propagate to you, but also propagate back to other libraries that held um, physical copies of this material. Um, yeah. So th this is one that, um, you know, very much in the spirit of, of your comments about how we have to deal with this as a, a sort of a systemic community thing um, is, is something that I think calls for all of our attention in making sure it gets sorted out. Um, uh, there's really, at least in my view, no excuse for not doing it. Um, Cliff, could I cut through to a, quest, a very specific question about that? Suppose that Google were to decide that it would be okay from their point of view for this metadata which they don't claim to own um, to be distributed under a under a, um, a common commons Creative Commons license of some kind, would OCLC object? Would libraries object? Would that be possible? Uh, I can't speak for OCLC in that vein. I'm saying for a prediction, not a. I, I think there that, that there have been some calls for that and some serious thought about that. I think that there are some questions about exactly what kind of a Creative Commons license would be appropriate. S similarly, I really can't speak for the member libraries in OCLC other than to say that um, 
they're a pretty diverse bunch, and they include, you know, national libraries who view, I think, those records as absolutely public domain. They're the ones they contribute through others that, um, you know, would like to see them used in, in ways consistent with the mission and value of libraries. Uh, I, I think that's a really complicated... But surely this is a very important point to straighten out because even if all the texts become generally distributable, if the metadata is A, a mess, and B, unclear as to who owns it and who yeah. controls it and who's responsible for it, you're screwed. Yeah. Uh, it, this is absolutely a very important point to um, to straighten out, and I, I think it illustrates some of the not immediately visible interconnections between what's going on with the development of this Google database and, and the settlement and um, other you know sort of pieces of the broader uh, bibliographic management apparatus worldwide. And, and to Dan, if I could quickly, because Bob, you want to have a, a, a word about, um, I assume, <coughs> assume about metadata. D do, direct do to, to this. And uh, the librarian of UCMA said, so yes. there was a thing or two about metadata. Uh, the, the conversation to me feels like there aren't any librarians in the room, and I'm very <laughs> uncomfortable with that. Uh, <laughs> OCLC is an enormous international organization composed of a cooperative of libraries, uh, primarily the leading libraries. Uh, 65,000 the last at the last count uh, the world corpus of bibliographic information probably most of it resides there uh, very much a collaborative quality management uh, with all kinds of self-correcting input a cooperative uh, this is very reminiscent of the discussions that we had in the 70s when OCLC came online they said oh my god they uploaded this data it's so junky uh, we need to keep a perspective here. When you're trying to do research on a corpus and these errors that you're pointing out are absolutely critical to doing your research, but you have to think about the purpose that it's built for and also uh, the perspective. A single error on an item does not take away the tens or hundreds or when full text search, thousands of other access to that item. And so the purpose of libraries has been to connect people with these information objects. So we've got all kinds of redundant search tools that mitigate these mistakes. These metadata errors you're talking about, I promise you that if you will go in and carefully search the very best maintained library anywhere, pick one, Berkeley, San Diego, my little library in Merced, if you start digging about in that metadata, you're going to find the same things. But the context is the important part. Yes, you can find tens, hundreds, and thousands of them, but they are a tiny, tiny bit of the access mechanism. So yeah, we want to clean it up, we want to fix it, we all want to work on it. The libraries know how to do this, but it's a big effort. And uh, I want to go on that, it's a big well, effort. Maybe could oh, I just yeah. ask yeah. that, that reply? You may be right, but I, I like to think that if I go into the university, uh, the Merced University Library, I'm not going to find metadata error rates of 10, 30, 50%. I'm on, arguing on that you're not finding those right on, now. You're counting in a, in a spurious way. I'm, I'm taking records. I'm, I'm, I'm taking understand. records and I'm saying, how many of, and, and how many of these records is the date of the book as represented in the book correctly I understand. indicated? Taking, he's, he's taking records that emerge from a search that he yeah. wanted to do for an information acquisition reason. Right, 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 but 10% but would be to say, search for the word Google. Don't search for the word Google with 1899 restrict. Yeah. Look at the top thousand books. No, but here's How many of those? No, 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 I don't want to look at Google. I want to use Candy Bar. The reason I don't want to use Google is because most of the books that mention Google are going to be books you got from the publishers, and the metadata is going to be right. So what I want to look for is a word with um, uh, moderate frequency, very high diffusion, and, and stable over time. Yeah. A word or, 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 or expression. I want to look at that, and, and I'm, I look at the frequency there. Yeah. And then if I find uh, that the error rate, I've, I've done this yeah. with several expressions, and there it's between. Eight and fourteen percent, if, if 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 it's that kind of word. But if I discount all of the records that you got from the publishers and so on, I look at say just the orphan works and the historical works, then I'm at twenty, thirty percent. And but let me look at this. And and I can't believe that the UC Library or uh, the Merced Library or any library in this country misstates thirty percent of its of its records for any I'd, area I'd, of corpus. I say that you're. 
but yeah. we get the data from the library. Yeah. No, but you said you just said you got the data from the library. Well, but 30 percent of okay, the total let, let database is not here. wrong. That's, that's my point. That, that's yeah. a, let me make one other point here. I, I just looked while after you said that at the books that came up when I looked for Charles Dickens before the date of his birth, 18, 1812. Uh, the first thing that came up that there was a full text book that I could look at was a novel. Um, uh, Dickens appears in an advertisement in, an, in a novel published in 1890. Uh, from the UC Berkeley collection, uh, which contains a, um, as it happens, somebody penciled in the access number, the call number, uh, which ends in 1890, which is the date also given in the novel. So if a mistake was made, it wasn't made by Berkeley, that 1890 is there in the call number written in the book. It was because, my guess is because the 1890 may be a little blurred in the scan, Somebody tried automatically to extract the date and, and got the nine as a zero instead. And, and indeed, if you take those dates right. and but, you go but, to OCLC, but, but, you don't find You didn't them get in OCLC. that record from Berkeley that said 1800 because the Berkeley record's written in there and it's 1890. You haven't seen the complete record. There's other places where well, that changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, but, we, but we have looked at I mean, yeah. because you go to OCLC and look right. at the complete record okay. there. We Wait, see the. Um, as I the, the, um, yeah, so if I may, let, let's, let's, let's move on beyond the, the, the metadata question, if we may. Um, so there's, there is the sort of the claim, that's what, that's what you said. The, there's the last library claim. Um, so on the one side, people say, well, there are many other people are doing this, though I have to say that I've talked to some fairly wealthy foundations who have said we've been told by our boards to stop because Google is doing this. Um, there is also, I think has not been accounted, is an immense amount of the strain that has been put on libraries that have already committed the books <coughs> to scanning for Google and have pulled them out of repositories and stacks and had them scanned and put them back and are they going to be asked to do that a second time and a third time and a fourth time, whatever the cost. Um, but in general, uh, Jeff, it's, it's your claim. Um, um, would you want to speak to this? I mean, is this the last library? Well, it depends what you mean library. These are, this is the last time, surely, I mean, and, and, and Clifford might have more to say about it. The last time, surely, that many of these um, uh, maybe perhaps the majority of these um, works are going to be are going to be scanned. If Google hadn't done it, would somebody else have done it? Yeah, but once it's done once, there's very little percentage in doing it again. It costs a lot of money. The cost is not going to come down, as you know. You may get better at OCR, but it is, it, it'll be a long time before we have robots that can go to the shelves and pull these things out and turn the pages and so on. That's where the cost comes in. So that cost is always going to be the same, and the cost of going back and rescanning all of those books by hand. Uh, it's going to be such that it's hard to believe anybody will find it to their advantage to do that. So these are the files people will be looking at in, in 100 years. So, and, and in this, in this, we didn't get into the whole um, scanning strategy, but um, there certainly will be some books that aren't scanned again. Okay, I, I will completely agree with that. Um, and in fact, I've always, and, and when I say scanned again, sometimes it might be Google scanning again, sometimes the Internet Archive may be scanning, sometimes there are other initiatives that may be scanning. Um, and that over time, I do think some of these books will certainly be scanned multiple times, okay? Um, and in this, part of this is a question about, you know, the importance and the criticality of some, and with the scanning. With your metadata concerns, that's not with the scanning, right? In yeah, other no, words, that's, a, yeah. that, that's independent of the scanning. Mm -hmm. With the issue of there's a scan and it's not as good a quality that we want, right? That's where you come into this question of will it be scanned again, okay? And to the extent, I know Google right now is to the extent when it finds problems, it's actually fixing them, okay? I do think others also will find things that get high usage and have demand and they will go and scan their own version of that book, okay? So one of the things that we'll see is as these books get usage, as Happy Trust gets usage, as the research corpus gets usage, as other things get usage, people will come in and complete a picture, if you will, by scanning other copies of the book, scanning their books we aren't scanning, right? Their books that don't fit our technology. So there are lots of other folks that will be scanning. But, but, but all these are, you admit, in that argument, being done against the background of what Google has scanned already. People will fill in gaps. People will do things a second time. People will repair problems. But you're not really suggesting either that somebody's going to get up and do what you've done all over again without some fairly significant incentive to do so. so. so uh, or that, are you suggesting that? I, I'm right, right, right. Whether or not, th th there are two hypotheticals. Suppose Google hadn't done this. And, and Ed, going to your question, alas, it's not tens of millions of dollars. OK, it's, it's a lot more. So one of the factors in this is if this were tens of millions of dollars, we wouldn't be all be sitting here 
uh, Microsoft would have kept scanning, everybody would be, it would be a much simpler problem. So alas, it's much more than tens of millions of dollars. Um, and there are two hypotheticals. There's one hypothetical that says, if Google wouldn't have done this, would somebody else have come up with the funding? There's another hypothetical that says, given that Google has done it, how much does that decrease the likelihood of someone else doing it? Right. Which I think, and that was and that's, point. That's, okay. that was right. the point. Your that's point the is that given that it's there, that some people, and this is one thing, Paul, that, you know, in other words, mm -hmm. if you don't, Google doesn't come out and say, no, you shouldn't no, fund no, scanning. No, absolutely not. Right? No. That, in fact, part of this is trying to make sure we articulate that the right solution is not just one. Okay, will somebody else scan it all? I, you know, I don't know, Paul. I think it's but reasonable to say. Guess. I think on both of them, I think it's unlikely in both cases. In other words, if Google wouldn't have done it, would someone else have done it? I think probably not. Oh, you don't think so? I don't think so. Sooner or later, somebody. I, I, I think it. I think it would have been. Okay, uh, we have. If I so, if I take that, we we have five minutes. Do we have some more? Yes, one, one there, one here, and one over there. If we take those three last, that'll probably get us to the the end. So yeah. Sure. This is Fred von Lohmann. I'm uh, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and just to follow up on this question of will this be the last library in the sense of scanning all these books? Um, we at EFF suggested uh, a while ago that Google should, in essence, escrow these scans. I understand Google deserves some period, uh, otherwise why spend the money if you can't get any exclusive benefit from the scans you've done, but I think Google is not asserting that it gets a separate copyright just for the sake of scanning, um, a position for which I applaud Google. Um, I think it's the right and sensible position. Uh, but similarly, I think Google should think, why should we need uh, someone else in 30 years to have to scan every book in order to get on the same footing? So I guess my question here is, would it be reasonable after a period of years, 28 was good enough for the <laughs> Copyright Act for our founding fathers, um, why not have Google, as a condition of having the benefit of the class action settlement, make all of those scans available to anyone who might want them? Uh, again, of course, they have to pay the right copyright royalties. You know, it wouldn't be a carte blanche, but it would put everyone who was willing to play by the same rules in the same position vis-a-vis -vis this, what we all agree is a sunk cost, really one-time investment in comprehensive scan. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more, we had one somewhere down here. If I might, just as the microphone walks down the, the road here, say that actually it was good enough for the statute of Anne rather than the founding fathers. But that, 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 just a little bit of national parochialism. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was called parochial on the same mailing list for these <laughs> So I thought I should show my stuff. But not yet, by me. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Tom Krasit with CNET. Uh, and I was wondering uh, how much money Google has spent Digitizing books. Yeah, we, we okay. Well, let's hold it. Hold that question. We'll get the third one in, and then we'll answer all three if we may. Uh, my question is for. Could you identify Dave. yourself? Please? Oh, my name is Mari Miller. I'm a librarian and proud of it. Um, my question is for Dan, and I wanted to know since libraries, our catalogs have very good metadata. Why don't you partner more deeply with library associations? Okay, so those, I think those three questions are actually all for Dan, and Dan, we've got about three minutes. Three minutes. So, so the last, I'll, I'll do it in reverse because it's easier. So we do actually, again, that's the point that they're saying. We get the, li we get the metadata from the library. But I can say, you know, you could have more input into your process, you know, like if you could have a library advisory board, you could be talking to OCR about the OCLC more. Oh. We, we actually talk to OCLC a ton. We, we, have, we have over 40 library partners that actually we talk to all the time. So um, I think we actually we get a lot of input. We still could do more. But, um, uh, and we, we, many of the challenges with OCLC, we actually communicate with them. Our library partners communicate with them. And part of it is just a tough problem. Okay, but the one they're all waiting for, Dan, the money yeah. question. Oh, the, nice. um, the money. So, uh, alas, um, we do not publicly disclose that. <laughs> um, we've scanned over 10 million. Um, there are various folks in here that can probably give you estimates of, um, you know, how much it would cost them to scan Internet Archive that's public about what it costs per book. They, their cost is roughly about $30 a book is, I believe, what they say. Um, you know, we haven't publicly said what it is per book, um, but, you how know. Would it be? 
Uh, it might be. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> and, and finally, the uh, escrow uh, question. Uh, uh, the, uh, the escrow question. So, Fred, you know, interesting idea. I mean, we do for public domain stuff. That's effectively what we do with our library partners. That, in fact, um, with the new contract, they're actually already able to share for scholarly and research purposes freely. And in fact, we then give a date where all restrictions lift completely. Um, whether or not something like that makes sense for the in copyright stuff. Um, that gets into all sorts of complexities about class action and, you know, can a class action um, uh, uh, then grant anyone else's usage and would the rights holders be happy that we're giving the scans away? Um, interesting hypothetical thought about having a period, but it's not there now. Um, so I don't know if that's the right thing or not. Okay, thank you. That's Fair Clock. Please thank the panel, I think, who are high quality. <laughs>